This film contains actual accounts and depictions of war. Some material may be graphic and not suitable for all audiences. Time is 1951. Hi, I'm Haley Reese Martinez, the wife of Aaron Martinez, the director for Struggle Beyond the Decade. I hope you enjoy this film. I don't know why that number's so high. I can only speak for a small percentage of it, so that's what I'm going to talk about right now. And when I explain that to people, what I ask them to understand is that the relationship forged between men in combat is similar to that between a parent and a child. And for a veteran, there is no greater loss than that of a brother in combat. To actually see him fall. And the biggest lie of your life, you tell to yourself the rest of your life, that being you could have done something different to alter that outcome. And you simply couldn't. And while you saw them fall, you know they're gone. They're not really gone. Because every night when you close your eyes, you see their faces in the shadows of your dreams. Constant reminders of the brotherhood, of the camaraderie, of the family you search for the rest of your life, but intuitively know you'll never find. Now, friends and family, they try to span that emotional divide. They try to bridge the gap. But it's, it's pointless. I mean, they may as well look up to the stars and try and talk to people in the distant galaxies, talk to you. And that's because serving with men that died by your side, sometimes in your arms, proving their worth to you has rendered pre-war family and friends untrustworthy, undependable. Translation, there's a stranger among us. That stranger's the veteran. It's me. the broadcasting systems and affiliated stations to present Aaron Martinez and Pratt Ham Productions on the air in the war of the year. Are you gonna call her from over there when you miss her? <laughs> 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 Like you said, right? Look, everything's gonna be fine. You just stop whining about it, Bob. I didn't know what to do. Facing all these new decisions. And then Hi. I met the one. I joined the army because my older brother joined the army and uh, thought it was a good idea. He was gonna go down and uh, to the MEPS and take the test and all that stuff and asked if I wanted to come with him. So I said, yeah, sure, why not? So we ended up going to the MEPS, uh, taking the test, and doing every all the pre-screens with the doctors and all that. And I ended up getting in, and he ended up not getting in. Hmm. So, uh, you know, all said and done, it was, you know, Midwestern kids. So we were pretty loyal to, you know, decisions that we made. So I just stuck with it and said, why not? I hopped on the uh, bus when it was time to go and headed to Fort Knox to basic training. Uh, my name's Eric Heiss. Um, 
I'm from, uh, grew up in Champaign, Illinois. It's a great place, by the way. Um, I originally started out in the Marine Corps as an 0311. I went through boot camp uh, in 93 and then got out in 97 to go to college. Went to college, got bored with that. And then um, it was 2000 and the beginning of 2001. Um, met with a went, well, went in the Marine Corps office and said, "Hey, man, I want to switch my job. I want to be a uh, I want to be a tanker. You know, I don't want to be an 03. I want to be a grunt, man. I want to ride." And he's like, "No, you got a choice, man. If you want back in the Corps, you got to go in as a grunt." Nah. So I, I walked out, and the Army guy caught me on the way out. He's like, "You want to be a tanker?" I heard that. And so there it was. Got in the Army, and uh, first duty station was South Korea. You know. I, did great there, flourished, made E5 within, I think, four months. It was the first four months, they offered me a gunner spot, and that gunner spot is my, uh, was my home. It was my home, I loved it, man, I loved it. People that belong to the tanker world, that's a pretty specified, <laughs> specified uh, group of people. Um, you had your, um, it's like, a, it's like a culture. It's like you had your tanker culture. You had, um, it, was, it, it wasn't pretty. It was not um, polished in any way. Just as long as your shit worked, as long as your tank worked, then as long as your shit was squared away, as far as like operations and shit, we did not care about um, the dog and pony whole business, you know, cause that wasn't our, that wasn't our, that wasn't our deal, you know, cause we were kind of indoctrinated you know, passed down over over the over the years. You know, Patton Patton was not politically correct. He didn't do any fucking dog and pony shows. I mean, he's he's vilified half the time, but he was a, he was a great fucking leader. And we all we all kind of fell into that kind of role. And the tankers followed. And we, uh, as far as crew goes, we uh, like the gunner and the tank commander. Well, the tank commanders are the top top dog on the tank and then the gunner is also an NCO and he takes care of the gunner is responsible for his loader and his driver the tank commander is responsible for everything involved with the tank like on a bigger scope and the gunner is responsible for his Joe's you know as far as you know like right place right time right uniform and the uh, just make sure that the freaking tank works when you're ready to go wherever you gotta go so a uh, tank crew is pretty dynamic. You have to have a cohesive group of individuals. You have to make your tank work. Because if you have one fool on that tank that doesn't know what they're doing, then you're gonna unk on the range. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna drop fast. So you gotta make sure your guys are, are there and doing what they're supposed to do. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a big thing with, with getting along. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a, it's a balance between, because there's, not everybody's gonna get along. Not every, there's there's no way everybody can get along, but um, you have to make it work. So um, I treated my my crew like family because my crew was my responsibility, and I felt it was my crew, even though at the time I was a gunner, wasn't a tank commander until we got to Iraq. Um, my my crew was my it was my crew. You know, even the even the tank commander was my my responsibility. So. Uh, So the day we were told we were uh, on the parade field and for me it was a pretty exciting time because at the time you know I was uh, a sergeant E5 and of course you know we always do all the NTC rotations we do all the field training you know on a tank for moments like this so for some of us like me you know very excited it was we finally got to do what we were trained to do we got to go do our job However, you know, there's some the new privates you can tell that coming straight up basic training in AIT that were not so excited as we were. So, you know, they were a little scared because, you know, it's the real deal. You're in the shit. You got to go to Iraq and, you know, do what you've been trained to do. So for, yeah, for a lot of us, very exciting. Uh, well, some of them, though, just couldn't handle it. They're just... Uh, you know, some broke down, 
some were scared. Matter of fact, I think we even had one uh, guy that went AWOL, you know, in the in that time. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. For me, that was that was a great feeling. Because I was I spent four years in the Marine Corps sucking in the jungle, this, that, and the other place, and never saw in the combat. And I, it felt like I wasn't doing I wasn't earning my paycheck. I wasn't doing my job. I mean I had I was the biggest bitcher and moaner and complainer when we were back in the barracks when the war kicked off. What the fuck are we doing back here? We're doing nothing. You know, it's it's like get get, get me out there. So when that when that call finally came, uh, I was I was elated. I was like finally, because you know, 9/11 had happened when I was in Korea, and it took from that time over a year and a half later to finally um, get in the fight and do my job, which um, it was the one uh, thing about that, that day. Um, I remember uh, Truman, our master of golf, he was behind me in the formation, and then behind me was uh, Singh. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of felt like it was a football game. It's like, it's time to celebrate, man. We're all like, oh, man, hey, this great fun. We get to do our job. And I turn around and I, I look in Singh's face and Singh is just, there's nothing there. He's not, he's not celebrating. He's like, it's like the worst possible thing he could have possibly fucking happened to him. And that's, I just heard about it. I heard about it. And then immediately I thought of uh, the last time I saw him. And, that was uh, kind of kind of mixed there, but um, he was one of the first uh, casualties that um, we took, and it's uh, you know it's it was shocking because we uh, um, it was the first uh, like the first uh, the, the time it hit home. Western skirts of Fallujah. 45 minutes into it. South Putnam got a kill. Are we killing it in the move? platoon ended up going to Fallujah and then we got attached a platoon worth of Bradleys from 116 infantry to which then in return gets attached to 82nd Airborne so now you're taking a bunch of tankers who have no reason to do airborne anything attached to a big huge 82nd Airborne company and for me I loved it it was awesome I think that they took care of us really well, and, you know, even not knowing how much it costs to fix a tank if it breaks down, or if you lose one like we happened to lose one in, uh, in Fallujah that had to be replaced. So I mean, they took it real well, they took care of us. Um, it was a change going from all tanks being a tank mentality, because there's a huge difference in mentality if you're on a 72 ton tank versus being infantry walking around with just your flak vest and your M4. I think there's a big difference between Huge. We, tanker people and tanker yes. people. Tanker people have a tendency 
kind of like I was, we had the invincibility. We were invincible. Nothing could hurt us. There was nothing in Iraq that could hurt us in our tank. So we, you know, especially me, we did have that mentality that we couldn't be hurt. It was, we were invincible. So we took crazy risks while we were over there because of that mentality, which sometimes, you know, almost backfired, but hey, I'm still here, we're good. There are a lot of nights that I wake up because I have images stuck in my head. People being shot, people I've shot, people's head exploding where you can see their brains, their faces split into two, missing legs and arms, teenage kids with their guts hanging out, blood everywhere. On top of that, what little emotion and, and feelings I did have is slowly fading away. So it must have been September. All right, so we got out there and uh, it was Harder, myself, Cal, and I think Carr was in the tank. And we got out there and um, we were staking out the cloverleaf. And it was a hot spot. You know, I guess the, what was it, the contractors or something that um, they hung them from that, from that cloverleaf there right before we got there. And we were all, you know, we kind of knew what to expect from that. So anyhow, roll that and we're sitting there. We're, we're up the road a little bit from the cloverleaf and we're sitting there watching, uh, watching town and, you know, just, just watching, watching. And then we knew the 82nd was right down there on the underside of the bridge that was right there to the, the north of the cloverleaf. And they just, uh, they had to light up a truck and, um, that after they lit that up we got a call from uh, Jordan's tank and um, they had taken fire on the other side of Cloverleaf there so we, we we scooted down caught them blocked out all the traffic off at the Cloverleaf there and um, underneath to come from Fallujah outlet so um, we had that covered while they cleaned up the mess behind us and <laughs> We, we tried to stop the traffic. Nobody spoke English. The hand signals, sign language, it doesn't work, I guess. This doesn't mean, you know, go the other way. They just kept trying to come. So Harder had to get off the tank and run after them and tell them to go the other way because, you know, just, we're taking care of everything behind us. And then this one car just kept rolling up. Just quick. It was quick. That's when Harder was off the tank. I had the decision to as the gunner, because I'm, you know, I can see it, and I can see where Harder's at, and I can see where this car is coming right at us. Then uh, Cal was on there too. Me and me and Cal started opening up on this car, stopped it, and then um, that was the first, first real engagement. Nothing. I don't know, nothing, nothing really happened there, but first time I saw a, a dead body, that was weird, because it, um, didn't know if it was dead or not. Like one of the 116 guys was like, um, you gotta poke him in the eyeball with your, uh, with the muzzle. You know, if they blink or they flinch or whatever, they're still alive. It's like, this guy's looking at me. This guy's straight up looking, staring at me. I mean, no matter, it was kind of like that painting where you never around, the guy's staring at you. It's ridiculous, just looking at him. He just poked him in the eyeball, nothing. It's like, all right, so that is, because uh, there was nothing else wrong. It was like he was just laying there, looking at me. It's an odd feeling, but I don't know, more of that to come later, I guess, because we saw plenty, plenty of those guys in much, much worse shape. I think they were, I don't know, that guy was in one piece at least, so. Our mission was to go out and sit by this chicken truck that was got caught in between a, a battle between you know us and you know the terrorists and whether or not they were the terrorists in the truck anyway you know long story short chicken truck got shot up there was a bunch of chickens in the back of it so you know you can just imagine i mean it <clears throat> was weird freaked me out because I mean just the sounds of the chickens were making just made it sound like you know this ghostly sound so you can imagine you know you know at the time when we were you know what 23 24 years old you know in the middle of the night sitting in Fallujah only been there you know
no less than a month being in country, so still getting used to being you know, shots being fired, being shot at. And then you start hearing the chickens in the back of this truck sounding like ghosts because you know, and we've checked, you know, because you have to check the entire truck, you know, checking the truck, you see that there's three, maybe four people inside this truck all mangled together and shot up dead. So, of course, that was our mission was to stay by the truck until they can come and retrieve the bodies and, you know, do what they need to do with them. So, yeah, the chicken truck, uh, it gave me nightmares for a while, listening to chickens that just didn't sound, because, you know, when you're a kid, you're told a chicken sounds like this. Well, these fucking chickens didn't sound like real chickens. They just it sounded weird. And so, yeah, it was a little freaky. Creeped me out for a little while. in a row you got me with that's that. right that's right thank you for playing i appreciate you coming in here and playing cards with me Yo, today. Man, I just get kind of bored laying around here all the time it's like when are we gonna see some action or something don't worry about it p man we're gonna get we're in flying there. off the shelves i mean that's what it is i mean we're gonna be we're gonna be doing it man we're in fallujah we're, we're flying off the shelves here, over here and yeah i know i'm just getting really bored you know all we do is lay yeah. around could be doing this at home i'm just uh, trying to me out summer and chance, stuff you know uh, i'm just bored the commander i'm letting you guys know you're on fallujah fallujah Really? Um, the Holy One was kind of a play on words. Um, the Holy One, it was supposed to be some giant holy war or something between us and Islam, which is complete. Anyhow, um, it's, it's a hole in one, the Holy One. It's a 120 millimeter round. I didn't find out about this till what? The Sergeant Major was saying something about that the next day. He said, yeah, this guy had a, uh, cause I was shooting at him behind, he was behind a, a, a pretty thick wall and my, my coax kept jamming. Um, and I ended up hitting him um, dead center with a, the, with, a, with a main gun around. And it went through him, um, cause I didn't realize at that time, with my infinite tanker knowledge, I didn't realize that heat rounds don't arm. In urban combat, they're not gonna arm until three or 400 meters down the road and that's where that explosion came from which you know this is all putting pieces together after the fact because it was kind of crazy when it was going on but um that's where the holy one came from because it was a whole it was a uh, stupid golf reference or something but now uh we got called out it was the night that um saddam got captured december 14 13 14 12 something like that it was the middle of december Saddam just got captured, and the people of Fallujah were going ape shit apparently. And we were just sitting back in our barracks. We we're off mission, and they they called up, and they were like, "We need a tank. We need a tank immediately because we're taking off to Fallujah because they're they're ripping the town apart." And it was a quick QRF. We were playing cards. We were playing domino. You know, everybody's just around playing cards or dominoes. We play spades or dominoes. That's that's what we do in the army. But uh, we get the call, so we just. Of course, I mean, we're always up for it. So we just drop everything. We grab what we can grab and we jet down to the tank and we hop in. And, you know, at this mission, it was a hodgepodge. We weren't even with the correct crews. We just, we didn't give a shit. We were like, fuck it, we're going. So uh, myself, Marty, Cal, Putnam, real quick, jumped up and we just got a tank. We weren't the tank crew. We were kind of spread on different tanks. Um, but we got this tank crew together and we rolled out real quick. Sergeant Putnam, he was a gunner. On, uh, he was on the LT's tank originally. And then uh, 
went to uh, San Martinez tank, but uh, he was he was a gunner, but he filled in as loader, and I had filled in as gunner. San Martinez took the TC spot as he's TC, and then uh, Cal had volunteered to go into the driver's hole, so that's that put the crew together. That put the crew together that I was just kind of a hasty, like who wants to go, you know? And I don't know, we're like sit back here and watch this happen on the news i'm no we're gonna we're gonna go in there and and be a part of it it was a super crew it was the best I, i'd say right there that that would be a crew that if we could have gone all through iraq hell i'd probably have stayed another year <clears throat> and i think we would have i think we would have closed down shop i mean that was the you know driver the loader the gun i mean we could have even inter you know, mingled with, if somebody else had to drive, bam, we would have jumped out. We had the crew that was, yeah, that was an all-star crew right there. Those were the people that I felt safest with. So if I had to be on a tank and I had to go out there and I had to risk my life, those were, those were the people I wanted. So, and luckily we ended up all in the same tank. We just rolled out. The night started off, they were looting the place. You know, they were tearing the mayor's cell apart. I mean, uh, was it the, the, the floor tiles? Just leave the floor tiles. Don't take my floor tiles. They were taking everything, um, just looting the place, destroying the town. And of course, the 82nd, and that, in that capacity at the time, this was prior to the Marines coming in, the 82nd was more of a uh, stability force. It was not an assault force. They were trying to stabilize and they were trying to get the country stabilized. That was, you know, that was the, the overall mission. You know, they were doing their, they were doing their damnedest to keep, to keep, you know, trouble at bay and trying to get in there. And they went in and talked to the, that was, we all rolled out, there's a bunch of Humvees in front of us. We had a Bradley, we had 187 XO and his esteemed gunner from, I'm not being sarcastic, his, these guys were deadly. These guys were, you, you, if you wanted to go out and have a good time in sector, you went out, went out with uh, 187. Um, anyhow, it was us and them, and then a bunch of Humvees from the 82nd in front of us, and they get into town, and... We're just closing in, getting closer and closer and closer, and eventually we stop and sit there, and it's kind of like sketchy. Are we gonna continue going on in here, or are we just going to wait and see what happens? So yeah, it's, uh, it was eerie, you know, especially being in the loader state. I'm used to being in the gunner station down there and the gunner, you can't see nothing, you know, nothing can get to you, but being a loader, you're out. And you know, I mean, we got, we're looking up at these, you know, four or five story buildings. Anybody could have been on top of those buildings. Looking around, just scanning. That's what I do, that's my job. I scan and look around because, you know, the tank can see for, for quite quite a while and he's got night vision so you can see all these fools thinking they're you know, being sneaky and then I see a uh, um, seal boy with uh, must have had a gun rack on his back because he had like RPGs it was like the head of an RPG and you could tell he had RPKs and AK everything slung just moving it from one place to another I call it and of course I told for Martinez and Martinez I called out and, um, he said, uh, they came back and said, no, don't touch it. Just let us get, I guess, just let us get done with what we're doing here and let's get out. We don't want no trouble. Um, which was commendable, but not realistic, I don't think, because the next, I think we sat there, I remember that silence for like a few seconds, like after, after everything was, like the, the comma went dead for like, just a weird days, maybe only a few seconds, but it went dead enough to know that it wasn't wasn't good and then all of a sudden it just started raining i mean like it, it looked like a fireworks show but opposite it's like people were shooting fireworks from the air coming down to us um bradley got hit their combo got knocked out and everybody just started scrambling under under their vehicles and then i'm just like let's get up there let's get up there let's get up there you know we got a tank we got a tank and then quickly once, once Marty radio, radioed up to. So 
you know, you hear over the radio, you know, you know, we get ambushed, RPGs, you know, and then we roll up, and then that's when you see the Humvees are parked, you know, people are hiding behind the Humvees, shooting back, and you know, that's when we decided, hey, it's time for us to close down shop. It's kind of like, I was thinking of like Moses, um, it's like parking the those Humvees just started peeling off left and right, and then we, we rolled off right up through the center and didn't hesitate, because we were taking fire the whole time. I was seeing guys coming out, popping out, popping in, popping out, coming out from everywhere. I mean, it was, it was like, it, you, couldn't, you couldn't look anywhere without having a target. I was like, where do you start? And this whole time, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, 107, because they were, because I thought they, I thought they had got hit and they were gone. Because that, all I saw, all you see in the night sight is a uh, heat flash. It's a heat flash. And it's like, um, you know, I see plenty of IEDs go off on vehicles and it just disappears. And that was like the first time I saw that. And I thought they were gone because we couldn't get combo up or anything. And then we're getting up there, we're fighting. We're trying to, I don't know, what, you, what would you call it, stabilize? I don't know, it, it doesn't matter what you call it. We were just fighting. They were shooting at us, shooting at them. Um, Holy One popped out behind uh, the brick wall. Coax jam. I couldn't get anything. I'm like, I got to put heat, thro heat round through this wall. Pop back in, put the heat round through, and then uh, my night sights were were obscured because I've got a, a giant fire going on two blocks down where the, the heat round went off. I guess it was uh, it was really bad uh, collateral damage on that, and that's when uh, well the next day I learned how to uh, skip rounds to try to limit that kind of destruction. But um, anyhow. Take a fire, and then we, and then um, 187. I know he's next to us because I see this trail of tiny little heat rounds. The Bradley has a little tiny heat rounds. They're awesome. Boop, 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 boop. And then, poop, like a, a guy is gone. He just disappears. It's like a, and I kind of, kind of fills up a little part of the thing. I'm like, well, they're not. <laughs> they're here. There he starts rolling up and engaging with us, and we, uh, we engage, continue to engage um, until they expel, until 82nd got their got their guys out of there, and they got all their Humvees out of there. I don't think we had one casualty that night, not one on our well on our side, I guess. And then we did we did our job that night. And that's when we pull in, and that's where we, you know, now goes back to the point when we're sitting between these buildings that feel like they're getting closer and closer together. And, you know, next thing you know is sure as shit, you know, there's the terrorist, Iraqi, I mean, whatever you want to call them, but these bastards were up on the roof, RPGs, and it's like they all came over at once, and next thing you know, you just... RPGs flying through the air, you can see the smoke stream, you can just, you know, hear the RPGs hitting, you know, by the tank, side of the tank, you know, I, after all said and done, you know, yeah, there's marks all over the tank that we, we were hit by RPGs on the tank, and, you know, and of course with our mentality, we didn't care, it wasn't hurting us, you know, bullets were whizzing by our heads, I mean, you can literally hear the whiz of a bullet fly by your head. They were pushing behind us, pulling up, and then they found uh, the Holy One. He said he had a just a 120 mil round, and it, 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 you know, just a cauterized face. Was that was that a motorcycle? I fucking love motorcycles. Anyhow, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so that was it. Our major said, so our major said you put. Uh, there's this guy who shot. He asked who shot the tank round. It was only one tank. It was kind of a rhetorical question. Who shot the tank round? And I guess I uh, I made the. Uh, the golfing equivalent of a hole in one being that supposedly it's some stupid holy war, so it's a holy one. And then I put that on all my tanks because as kind of a uh, 
because it was it it wasn't right. It wasn't. It's not a holy war. I just put that on all my tanks like a like a like a, a guy in a man dress with with the AK and an RPG slung. He's got a hole in his chest. It's the most memorable for me, and it was the uh, the one that I had. But I mean, it literally, you know, what I think about is you know hell on earth so if you ever you know you've ever seen those you know movies where you know hell where hell is just flames and charred everything yeah that is the vision that I have of Iraq is just that battle you know turned in turned Fallujah into like hell on earth it was just flames smoke dead bodies everywhere it was uh I don't know. I mean, it was awesome sound to hear because it was, you know, it's a battle. That's what you were there for. That's what we wanted. Ended up, you know, just loving the sound of hearing that 50 cal just thumping. And then, uh, you know, the coax just tearing through stuff. And then the main gun, the best. I'd say there's one image that sticks with me over the years because it's that uh, photo of. <laughs> Saul Martinez with his crucifix and in the backdrop you've got um, you've got your minaret and it was just it was iconic it was an iconic photo it was like the photo that captured our whole run during there you know because I don't know anybody any other tankers that are watching would would, would uh, think that a minaret is like the holy grail of putting a tank around through and I never got the chance, and I heard the Marines came in and they put a tank ground through one. I was so wanting to knock those down. Not for religious purposes, you know, I am by no means prejudiced to anybody, religious, or whatever the hell you want to do, I don't care. You know, it's, it's freaking America, you can do what you want. But that photo kind of captured not what I felt, what was wrong with what other people felt because that's not why we were, we were there. We were not there to impose our will as on a personal level. I can't speak for who, you know, whoever's in charge. I don't know, you know, whoever may have been running this shit show, whoever's in charge of this, they, may, they might have had an agenda but that did not filter down to us. We didn't, we were there to survive. We were there to stabilize, which was an impossible mission, by the way, because there, the more you know, just violence begets violence, and it's it, it kept on going. There's nothing that you could do other than throw up your arms, let them hang you from the clover leaf, and you know, whoever survived go back home. That's the only peaceful solution to the whole thing. No, it's it was a constant battle between just surviving, and that's the only thing that that mattered to me. Being there, I I really. Um, I cared about my Joes. I cared about getting all them back. Carpets are flying off the shelves down here. You can't, you can't even... Pay attention now, Heist. This is important stuff. I know you were a carpet salesman before you joined the army, but flying off the this shelves. is real stuff. This is real war here. Now listen here. You're going to do it my way, and we're going to go in there right. You're going to go up in here on the left side of Fallujah. Now this isn't this carpet business anymore here. You understand that, Heist? This isn't carpet business. We're going to Fallujah. We're going to war up here on the left side. I keep pointing at it. Mm-hmm. Hi, son. I know you enjoy selling carpets much more than this stuff, but this is important stuff. This is real war. We need you to go no, in that time. No, Look, look, look. The carpets are flying up the shelf, sir. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get over here. talking about carpets. I'll tell you how to do things. You're still talking about carpets It's, uh, it's gonna is... be a good thing, me and you. We're gonna be a good thing. It's gonna be a good team. Carpets are flying up the shelf. Yes, sir. Better do it. So originally, yes, I was on uh, I was on Lieutenant Smith's tank, but of course, you know, there's always different leadership styles. So uh, his his leadership style clashed with mine. I was kind of clashed because you know it was almost like it was the same. You know, he was hard headed. He wouldn't listen very well. I was definitely hard headed. And I wasn't gonna listen to anything because 
I've been in the army long enough. I knew exactly what we were doing. We've trained for it. I've been on the tank for, you know, especially when you get a new lieutenant, a lot longer than, you know, a new lieutenant coming into the army. So I knew what needed to be done. So my leadership style is every time I try to get the crew to do what I wanted and what I knew needed to be done, you know, it would clash sometimes with him thinking something else was a more priority. You know, like it was a more priority to um, wipe down the weapons versus walk your track. You know, and everybody know you on a tank. If you don't walk your track and your track falls off in the middle of Fallujah, you know, which of course we've had that happen too. But, you know, it's that kind of deal there where, where, where it would clash. So, you know, we would uh, lay out track, you know, we'd walk it, we'd put everything back together, you know, he wanted to know how to do it. We try to tell him how we do it, what works, because we've done it many times before, you know, but he always had a better way. This way was better, this way was better, but as we started going towards, you know, ways that he wanted to do it, more risky, and I felt as if, you know, more people were going to get hurt, not out on a mission, but I mean, then that's the worst thing you can do. It's bullshit to be in Iraq and get hurt walking track, fixing your track, climbing on a tank, off a tank, you know, just that right there to me would be pointless and why I did not like to take the extra little risks or shortcuts in order to make it happen faster. I mean, we have all the time in the world. We're there. We're not going anywhere. We're in Iraq. If we have to work all day, all night, we will. So we can afford to take the slower route and the safer route. So yeah, I mean, it was clash of leadership styles. I had mine. He had his. He thinks he's right. I thought I was right. You know, so that's where it all came down to before I actually requested to uh, switch tanks. Yeah, so uh, with maintenance checks, I mean, that was, uh, of course, you know, yeah, as you said, tanks were made to go, you know, across desert, across dirt, ground, not sit there and drive back and forth on a hardball, which we have been, you know, that's all we were doing, driving back and forth on hardballs because that was the safest route anyway while we we're there. So, of course, your track's gonna start breaking down, you know, track's gonna fall off, you know, your hubs are gonna leak oil or even break and then have no oil whatsoever, and then your, you know, all your arms, everything is, is crazy. So, you know, we ended up you know happened to do it while we were out there so of course you know our plan was hey let's play it safe we'll just take we have two tanks anyway we'll just drive by each other and as we drive by you know hey you look at mine I'll look at yours and make sure there's nothing missing make sure the tracks not uh, wobbling or look like it's gonna fall off or you know you're missing any you know hubs or anything like that so I mean it, great plan never have to get off your tank and do a walk around you just drive by and check each other out i mean if you needed really if you needed to get any closer look you could use the main gun to go ahead and look to make sure you know i mean you could get close enough to where you could actually see how much oil you had in your damn hubs so i mean it was the way we did it was uh, it was a safe way it was the best way we had our own sector However, for some reason that day, you know, Lieutenant Smith wanted to take over our sector and wanted us to take over his sector. Uh, reasoning behind that, I, you know, I can only speculate. I don't know. All I can say is our sector was, uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, more action in our sector than any other sector. And I think that's originally why we were chose to, you know, take that sector because we were the experienced crew. We knew what we were doing. So of course we were going to put ourselves in, you know, the more difficult sector to cover because we, you know, had a, a very experienced crew. You know, we weren't new, nobody was new. We were all experienced. So that day we decided uh, he wanted to switch. So we switched and uh, instead of 
um, driving by and checking out track. Uh, for some reason, he made the decision that he wanted to get off of the tank and walk around the tank in, uh, in order to do, you know, walk the track and check out all the stuff. And, you know, from what I would recall, it, you know, he took his CBC off, which, I mean, you should have never have done. I mean, that's protecting your head. I mean, if you're gonna get off, okay, make sure you have security, make sure you have all your gear on. And, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, that day he decided not to, and he decided to get off of his tank and walk around and walk track, um, you know, in the middle of the most dangerous sector in Fallujah. Call over the radio was they thought that he had uh, stepped on a landmine or an IED had gone off. So, you know, of course everybody was like, what the fuck, why is he off the tank for one? And two is where the fuck is this IED? Where is this landmine? You know, you can't step on a landmine if you're not on the ground. So it was kind of confusing because we knew what we were supposed to do to check track and it was to not get off of the tank. So of course, you know, when you get that call that someone stepped on a landmine, you kind of kind of wonder what's going on, what's happening. So, you know, of course, that was the call that came over and we immediately, you know, started up and we rolled out to the sector to where we knew that the sitting, the most uh, advantageous sitting positions were because, we, you know, that was our sector. So that's where we headed to. It's happen you know, things happen quick. It's not, it's not something you can really, so I, I rolled down real, real fast on him. Like I, I rolled down and tried, I was cutting off his black vest. Um, and found the found the entry and exit ones and his um because kind of at first there was there was blood around there of course because his elbow had been blown off uh from the exit one so there was blood around there so it was kind of it was kind of it took me a second to figure out what was really going on um so i against all training um in the marine corps as an infantryman you never collapse on a, on a sniper victim but it was kind of hard to tell what was going on uh, at that point we had so much uh, we had so much support from uh, 116 and, um, and Marty's tank and sector got there right quick it was one of those okay you know y you think the best so I'm like sweet you know tank commander's getting off hey he's gonna run over there he's gonna bandage up that leg or whatever it is and we're gonna throw him back on the tank and we're gonna roll out you know so you always had the the best in your head you know for the best scenario that would happen so you know to me that's exactly what was happening so I'm pulling security well you know and I was just imagining I'm gonna pull 360 security until you know he gets bandaged up and thrown back on his tank and then we can roll out and continue our mission you know but of course you know as we know that wasn't the case and that didn't happen Martinez gets back on the tank and uh, you know Telly was in shock. It was uh, probably not experience. I mean, I, I never had that one-on-one -on -one experience to where, you know, me, my experience is dead bodies enemy, not dead bodies friendly, you know? So it's one of those things that, I mean, we weren't gonna question anything. He hopped back on the tank. I wasn't gonna ask what happened. I ain't gonna ask, you know, if you're doing okay, what are we gonna do now? So. You know, we got our we got our orders of what to do next, and what to do next was to find the bastards that did it. it. Started getting dark, so you know the sun's gone down. So now it's dark, and we're still patrolling. We're still looking, and you know, sure as shit, you've got uh, in the thermals. You can see three people, you know, hiding behind a bush you know, with weapons. So, you know, figuring that was it, you know, hey, I think by the time it was all said and done that, uh, you know, one of the weapons, you know, had the power and the capabilities to do what actually happened to Lieutenant Smith. So that's where I felt myself that, yeah, we got the fuckers that did it. So, you know, that night, I mean, the feelings were, you're always, pissed off you know one of your guys is now gone you know so of course you know it was you know upsetting so you're driving around 
Uh, I don't really want to call it revenge. Just, you know, you call it what you want to call it. Some people call it revenge. I, you know, I call it justice. So, you know, we did what we had to do. And, you know, I, I wouldn't have changed a thing. Just, it was the quickness of everybody else that was around around us at the time. I mean, we tried to we tried to save the LT, but I think he was gone well before they told us he was gone. Um, I'm pretty sure when myself and Martinez were down there working on him, I'm pretty sure he, he passed before before we took him in the helicopter and he got to the TQ. So, um, yeah, he was. He, he didn't say anything, which he couldn't. I guess he couldn't. With the way he was shot, he couldn't physically. He couldn't say anything. But looking in his eyes, you know, you could kind of uh, you see that disbelief and 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 kind of a uh, in a different place. So he knew that. Yeah, so, I, yeah, my thing that I really appreciate about him was that he, uh, he did it, um, as, as he was told, you know, he went, yeah, he, <laughs> I would, as much as we hated his ass, you know, he's probably one of the base heroes that, that I've ever known. Um, it, they were, luckily, there was only a short time to get through the, the rest of the couple months after that. I mean, and it was, you know, we had lost plenty of good guys before that. Um, it was, it was kind of like the, at, at that point, it was, it was it. It was like, we've got to get out of here. And then, uh, Tennis Smith, Sergeant Shepard. And Lieutenant Sand. Sand right after Lieutenant Smith. I mean, it was it was the it was kind of the it was just excessive at that point. And you know, I was at the end there. I, I personally, I was wearing my flak vest in the gunner station. <laughs> like that would stop an RPG seven. I don't know, but I was taking every precaution because you never know. They they were I think they were gunning more for us while we were leaving because they knew we were leaving. And like these guys aren't leaving alive. You know they're trying their best. So uh, it really uh, it really hit our platoon hard because um, um, we just after that everything changed. Um, we kept fighting, we kept fighting, um, and then it just, it, it was different, it changed, so. Even though, you know, you have issues or you didn't like, you know, Lieutenant Smith by no means was, you know, a well-liked guy. You know, a lot of people didn't like him. He was arrogant, he was stubborn, you know, wanted things his way and only his way, and that was, you know, that was that. However, you know, I mean, you know, how matter how much I hate an individual, you don't want to see them dead. And of course, you know, he was still a part of our platoon, so he's still a part of our family. Just like you, every family's got it. You may hate your brother, you may hate your sister, but damn it, you're going to do anything to fucking protect them, and you're going to do anything for them if they need it. So it's the same way. You know, a brother that you didn't like, and that you always disagreed with, you always butt heads with, but... All in all, still family, you know, and it still hurts just as much whether or not he was liked or he was hated. Yeah, that one's probably the, the hardest night of all, the whole, that's the one that hit me the hardest. Was that, was that night we had, uh, um, I went out in sector every day, you know, where there's always contact and whenever there's contact, you always want to roll up and, uh, I hope your wing tank is there. So we, uh, 
on contact, and we could actually see uh, Sergeant Martinez's tank down the road. We meaning uh, the new lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant McCarty, the Texas boy. It was great. It's great. <laughs> lieutenant McCarty, he was actually the uh, OIC of the prison there that, um, that brought those guys in. And then he debriefed us and then had the balls to take over our platoon after um, Smith. So uh, the guy's awesome. And he took over, he took over. And so it was myself and, and Martin and Carr, and we took off down there. Because on my night says I heard contact. Whenever you hear contact, contact's contact. <laughs> Especially with the council of Sergeant Martinez's is uh, Mike, you hear contact, you know you have to get down there quick. Contact RPG, north side of the road. There's not much time. And then I, you know, I focused down the road towards Charlie, and then I saw um, his 50 cal was white hot. His gun was going, so I'm putting him, was lighting him up, and I knew there was something big coming down, so we went down there. And we started engaging with him. Um, just hitting everything we could. That was everything. I mean, just kept going with it. And then one of the uh, buildings that I targeted was uh, at the at the time, it looked at me like an OP, you know, like it was up on the hill, the very top. So I aimed my gun at the base of the, the building and um, shot a heat round into it. And thinking nothing of it, I'm just like, that's just, you know, another, another one of these guys gone. Um, and then we hear over the combo and such crap. And then um, a medic, the 116 dismounts got off after after the the engagement was over, and they got in there and uh yeah and, and then we heard it over the radio. Um, it was uh it was just weird for yeah, here's something weird, you know, like uh, the the. A medic that's been there with 116 for an entire year is kind of balking and, and hesitating, and it's kind of odd. Like, I, I just really shook off about this whole thing. And um, I just, I'll just say it wasn't, um, it didn't happen to be uh, the bad guy in that in that building. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was an accident. That's yeah, probably the, probably the biggest thing that I, after that, I, I don't think I pulled the triggers after that. I was done. <laughs> like I'm done with this. I'm done with this deployment. After what I heard and after what they told me on the, on the, when I got back to the, the FOB, after I, after I heard what happened. I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't pull any more triggers, I was done, we we're going home. No matter how much, I mean, the amount of hatred that runs through, that ran through myself, I, I'm not speaking for everybody, but every day we went out, just hatred is what kept us going, because we were seeing people, our friends, everybody, gone. One day there, you, you never know, you never know, it's just, the amount of, somebody got hit, the hatred that came out of us the next day, that next mission, that next time we went out in sector, that hatred kind of fueled us through that whole deployment. You're deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of uh, last night's broadcast. Can, can you imagine this big yellow Abrams tank cruising down the street, leaving a wake of torn up asphalt, crushed cars behind it? It's not trying to do that. It's not trying to be destructive, but it's a tank. It's a weapon of war. Well, when the veteran comes back from war, it's the same thing. For that tank to be a school bus, clearly some changes have to be made. Yeah, so, I mean, coming home, of course, you know, you get told after, you know, 12 months, We I think we were there, you know, because we were 12 months in Iraq and then an entire month in Kuwait before we came home. So we were actually gone for 13 months, but... Uh, it, you know, it always, it felt good. You know, you're being told after 12 months, hey, going home, get to see the family, you know, sweet, excited, you know. However, when you 
think about it is now you know the life that you've known for the last year so fast paced so dangerous is not gonna be there when you know I'm not saying that I'm an adrenaline junkie by any means whatsoever you know but it's you know the same uh, how do you want to say it? you know the the same uh, anticipation of coming as it is going you know so you're excited to go and then you're excited to go home but then like you're excited to go to Iraq we get to Iraq and it was like holy shit we're in fucking Iraq <laughs> you know we're shooting real bullets we're not you know we don't have you know the damn uh, suppressors for miles gear we're not wearing miles gear anymore it, these are live fucking bullets so you know a little surreal and then it's the same way when you're going back home now you're used to instead of eating a fried chicken I'm used to taking cold showers used to living in a bunker you know used to you know just being dirty most of the time and uh, do a different thing so it, it was it's you know it's kind of one of those you're stuck in the middle it's excited to go home but then when you actually get back home it's like shit well you know I missed the fast pace of Iraq where we were you know all the friends that you made and the people that you got to stay with it, you're now separated you know you're not living together you know and you know I've been to some places that you know some guys okay I can't wait to not live with you and be away from you you know but you know as far as you know the crew goes you know um, you know San Martinez you know Heist Calderon you know I loved being around them every day all day We've never, we, I mean, that was one group that uh, we never had any issues. We never had any fights back and forth. We'd have fights with other people, but amongst ourselves and amongst our crew, we never had any fights whatsoever. We always had each other's back. You know, so now you come home, and of course you miss your family, but you know, this is another family that you've been living with for 12 months, and now you gotta go back, and you're, you know, you're not around. You're around each other, but not every day, all day long. So, you know, it's kind of one of those mixed emotion type things is, yeah, I want to go back and see my wife and kid, you know, but of course, shit, I you know I have this other family too, you know, that fuck it, we could all just moved in together. Hey, rock and roll probably would have been a little bit easier, but you know, you come back home. It was good. You know, it's good to see the family to be back home and to have all the amenities that you wanted, you know, cause everything that you take for granted was you know missed while you're in Kuwait because that shit wasn't there you can't just drive up and you know go to Burger King go through the drive-thru and be like hey give me this give me that you know want some fries and a burger can't do it you're eating chow hall food you're eating MREs you know for 12 months and then you come back home and you know it, it took a little bit to get used to so you know of course you know sleeping with my eyes open even driving a car was different because you know 12 months you're driving a tank or you're driving a Humvee and then you come back and you get into a Dodge Dart and it's like hmm okay let's go well <laughs> you know it may have a little bit more pickup speed but you know it can't handle what a tank can handle especially when you first came back I mean you know you drive down the road and you know there's a, a box in the road or garbage on the side of the road you know would find myself swerving around or driving around to avoid it thinking you know it could be an IED because you know of all the IEDs over there were always in trash and on the side of the roads you know um, anxiety yeah was a big one is I hated and I still do and I still hate groups of people to go into big groups of people and I don't do it I mean ain't been to a concert ain't been to I mean you know not yet I'll take you to Walmart Walmart is okay <laughs> you know Walmart was okay I mean now Walmart's okay but you know even back then when we first got back I mean Walmart was it, it was very taxing to go to places like that because you're always looking you're always okay who's this what are they doing what do they got you know looking around and I mean it's it, very tiring and you know I would come back from places like that exhausted and didn't even do nothing you know you walk around and get a few groceries and you're exhausted all day just because the anxiety gets to you and yeah huge groups of people still is not my thing one of the first things i noticed was that he slept with his eyes open um he did that for about three months and started right away when he came back 
Um, I think slowly as he got more comfortable being home, that kind of went away. And the other thing that was a huge difference was if he was sleeping, you couldn't get too close and try to wake him up. Um, he would reach for an imaginary gun, come up swinging, you know, things like that. So I learned quickly to kind of shake him and get away. So I wasn't in the crossfires of it. As far as other stuff, it was, it didn't take him too long to get back into like being with the family and stuff. Um, it was little things like just being out in public, like driving, and, you know, things like that because he's used to being in the tank. He could run over anything. And that's what he said. He's like, I can't drive for a while. And, you know, I need to kind of slowly get back into this and, you know, let me still kind of take control because Skyler was two and a half when he came back. So let me still kind of be in control since I'd been the only one here for so long. Um, but, you know, it took her about an hour to get used to him. So that was kind of nice. I think it helped him get back into <laughs> being back in, you know, in the family and stuff. But, I mean, it was definitely different. Yeah, it had to be really patient. I think it was a big help. I mean, she was a champ. I mean, of all the stuff going through, I mean, she could probably tell you stories, you know, uh, after I got back, sleeping with my eyes open, uh, trying to wake me up and, you know, just wake up swinging and, you know, she'd dodge it. But, I mean... You know, some people would be like, hey, this is too much to handle. I'm out of here. But instead, you know, she was one that was like, okay, I'm going to stick with it. We can handle this. You know, I can dodge. I'm pretty quick. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, it helped a lot. She did a lot to help me come back and, you know, just feel like everything was normal. So, I mean, and nothing really changed no matter how much... Um, I mean, she would probably claim that I have PTSD, but I say no. But, you know, anger issues, and, I mean, she just stuck with it, and, you know, I mean, she's a champ. And now that you are back, you've never felt so alone. You've never felt so much guilt and shame in your life. Now you just want to go back, and you won't have to worry about thanking people for thanking you for your service. You won't have to worry about feeling like you're alienating people. And that's just what you do. You alienate everybody around you. And there's a reason for that, because if you let anybody in, if you let anybody get close, you might lose them. And the thought of losing anyone else just brings you back to losing your brothers in combat. And for many veterans, it's just, it's just you can't go back to war and you can't go forward, or you feel like you can't go forward, the easiest solution for many is just to chamber around and drop the hammer. That's what many do. Well, I mean, veteran suicide, I mean, it always sucks. I mean, because you always think that, you know, they committed suicide, but, you know, never once reached out to you. I mean, you know, because we're a part of a family. So, and we're, you know, always be there for somebody. So, you know, just like, uh, you know, Sergeant Heiss, you know, when you know, we got split up and all that. I went out on recruiting, you know, it's probably been, you know, and even yourself, you know, probably been 12 years since we've seen each other. But, you know, at any point in time, you know, it's one of those things that at any point in time, you know, could have called me, you know, if struggling, especially if you're struggling, you know, call me. We would have said, come on over, hey, let's hang out. If I can, you know, you know, come to find out, you know, Sergeant High spent some time, you know, being homeless. You know, I would have been the first one to take his ass in if he would have just picked up the phone and called, you know, and we knew about it, you know, care where we were. Come on down. We'll come get you. Whatever it is. We'll so why do you why do you think that he would make that choice? If we and, and this is everybody, this is not just him. Yeah. This is so many fucking people. Almost everybody that I know has committed suicide or been on that statistic that I've read about is same way, they have a support structure. They're just not utilizing it. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that there is this gap of like people making that decision and during when they do have people they could reach out? Do they feel like they can't? So what I feel is, you know, when you're when you're in the army, you're in the military, whether you know, army, navy, air force, marine, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But being in the military. Uh, you know, every, you always have it in your mind that it takes a strong person. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be a man's man to be in the army, to be a tanker, to go do, you know, go to war. Why don't you just sit there and bleed a while before you taste some real pain? Any man that doesn't want to cooperate, I'll make him wish he hadn't been born. So I think that's where 
we get caught up with pride. We have too much pride in ourselves to think that we are too weak to handle our problems, that we can handle them ourselves. And then, you know, you think that way, eventually you're going to get to the point that it's, yeah, you've gone too far. Yeah, I mean, it's, we have a lot of dumb analogies when it comes to mental health. Because, I mean, you know, of course, everybody, when you start talking anything about mental health, it's all of a sudden now you're fucking loony, you're crazy, you know, you shouldn't be able to hold a weapon. But, you know, it's, and in reality, that's not, it's not true. But yeah, so the Army, especially back in our days when we were growing up through the Army, I mean, it may be starting to change a little bit now, but there's still, you know, okay, if I go to mental health, well, okay, I'm screwed. I'm going to lose my security clearance. Oh, I'm not going to be able to do the job that I can do. I'm not going to be able to go here, go there, or they're just going to kick me out of the army because, uh, you know, I have PTSD or I'm unstable now. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's still out there. So clearly the seeds of suicide, in my opinion, are planted on the battlefield. And they remain dormant for the most part while you're on the battlefield. Only now your tour of duty's up and it's time to rotate back home or you get injured. Either way, you're coming back home. And that's where they start to grow. From the second you step foot on that plane and arrive at the very same airports that our brothers and sisters from Vietnam arrived at and were greeted by people calling them names like baby killer, murderer, war criminal, go away. We don't want you in our country. You gotta say America gave itself a real good ass kicking and how it treated Vietnam veterans. Only now it's 45 years later in this generation of veterans from the Gulf War, Iraq, Afghanistan, and a dozen other places you've never heard of are returning home and they're arriving at those very same airports. And it's become an opportunity for those people that gave the Vietnam veterans such a hard time to redeem themselves. It's become an opportunity for America to redeem itself in relation to how it treats its veterans. And so we step off the plane. People are waving flags. Welcome home, you're a hero, we love you, we're so proud of you. And while many of the Vietnam veterans would have appreciated that type of reception, they, and this is the hard part, as this generation of veterans knows, there's some truth to those insults. You see, many of the things that happen in combat simply do not translate into being a hero. Yet you come back and everybody's saying, you're a hero, we're so proud of you. And so we come back and that's all we ever wanted was to make it back. And now that you are back, you've never felt so alone. You've never felt so much guilt and shame in your life. Now you just want to go back. And you won't have to worry about thanking people for thanking you for your service. You won't have to worry about feeling like you're alienating people. And that's just what you do. You alienate everybody around you. And there's a reason for that. Because if you let anybody in, if you let anybody get close, you might lose them. And the thought of losing anyone else just brings you back to losing your brothers in combat. I've had a couple, um, a couple close calls where um, just, well, the behavior in general, leading up to that point, it could have been managed better or noticed by myself, but at the time, you know, it's just normal, you know, abnormal, but normal for, for us. It's, it's, not, um, it's not anything that, that, uh, that I would pick up on at the time, just more, uh, just kind of pretty much out of control behavior, so. When all those things compounded, and this was when it came down to it, and I had to, I had to, I had to seek treatment. There was no other way to really avoid that. Um, I went and got went and got help. It was there. Um, there were local, the VA, um, police, ambulance service, everybody. They were they were there. They were there and kept me breathing. Um, but the second. Um, the last attempt was the most, um, I still to this day can't figure out what happened, no triggers, 
nothing. There was nothing there that really, because I'd been in treatment at this point for, you know, two or three years, going on two or three years. Um, well, two years, I think it was into it. And uh, was just having a regular, normal day at work. Got back, uh, I was by myself, and then I, it's nothing that I could think of during the day it really set me off. It's a normal day. I think the only thing that I really, really kind of maybe pointed out was the fact that uh, life was going in the right direction at that point. And maybe there was something in the back of my mind that told me this isn't right. You know, you, you don't deserve to be here. You know, you got that, you got that guy talking to you, telling you, you know, I mean, as good as it's going, you know, you haven't done enough. And maybe it just became too much and soon, you know, all I, I remember next, I'm looking at an empty, um, if you guys are on Seroquel or anything like that, a sleeping medication, a, I don't know, Ambien or whatever it was, I had a f whole full bottle and they give you, you know, good 50, 60 pills and that thing was empty. And um, luckily one of the one of the girls I worked with, she had uh, she got a hold of me somehow or somehow she knew I was in there and then sent a couple couple of her friends over to see how I was and they noticed it was off so she immediately called the ambulance and the ambulance crew arrived, the police arrived and I guess they were taking me out to the ambulance and that's when I dropped. I just, there was nothing, it was, I just dropped. And they said they had to throw me in there, I wasn't breathing, um, they had to do all the CPR and um, they had to do the, uh, just woke up with that that, uh, that that breathing thing, the trach or whatever that is in my in my lungs, and so I started coming too. It's like three days later, you know, it's a couple three days later, you know, not knowing what the hell happened where I was, and it's it scared the shit out of me because I ne I didn't know where this came from, you know, even though all the all the treatment, all the all the classes, the inpatient stuff, everything that w that led up to this point should have told me what had happened, but. There's something still in there. Something still in there. I needed to, uh, to to focus on, and you know, I was I was pretty much gone. I was gone, and that was that was my last experience with that. As soon as that happened, because it wasn't it wasn't a cry for help. It wasn't. I was alone. It was it was just my subconscious decision, I guess, to to disappear. Maybe it was uh, compounded things over the years. I don't know. You know, it, it all leads to that one thing. It all leads to that one moment. And then um, just got lucky. I, I was lucky enough to have someone there and someone that actually cared and, you know, kind of had a little history. You know, I, I, I don't make it a point to go into anything, anything uh, specific. You just know, you know, maybe time and place or wherever, where I was at. And this is the kind of guy he is. Um, I just knew something was up, but got me up there, uh, got me patched up and, uh, after that, I was just, you know, it's the same thing that, that got me through Iraq and the same, same thing that kept me, kept me, I, I have two daughters. You know, and just having to think about them going through, because I imagine, you know, maybe one day, they, they, they don't know anything yet. You know, one day they'll be old enough to understand that, because what, what an impact that would have had on my kids. And it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with my kids. It had, it had something to do with just the struggle I was going through at the time. And after that, after that time, after that one, I think I had maybe one more run in. I went to jail. I was looking at, looking at prison time and Luckily, the judge, he said, you know, go get fixed. He sent me to treatment again. That time it stuck. All these things, all these things, you know, somehow I managed to survive throughout all this and got it going. And then I knew, I knew what my, my life was clear at that point. You know, amount of time and amount of effort it took just to, you know, just it, the effort's worth it no matter every day if you just get up, do something, you know, um, just keep moving, keep breathing. And that's what I kept doing. And then, over 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 time, you know, it's different for everybody, and it's and it's been 10 years. It's been 10, 12 years, 10, 11, 12 years after the fact. You know, you think it's most of the strengths are like, you know, it's 
it was it was such a long time ago but and then a lot of them they understand that that during it, it hits you at different points you know it hits different people different ways so but getting back to my, my mission was clear at that point um, I had to I had to focus on what was really important to me and it wasn't it wasn't um, what's really important to me were, were, were my kids you know because they Yeah, they're the best. My kids are the best. You know, that's why I'm here. I focus on them. I don't, you know, I, d I know what's what's safe behavior and what's not safe for me. I don't go out. You know, um, sometimes isolation is, is is very counterproductive for most, but I find it, you know, a little safe haven. You know, like this, this beautiful lake right here. Stuff like this. I just I just wake up and appreciate this shit. You know, like here, spend as much time with my kids. And, and um, as I can, it's fortunate. It's very fortunate, you know. So I think, like, this is our this is our final day on, you know, having to having to talk about this. But it's it's important. It's very important. So you know, anybody that, that may that, that may be watching this, it's gone through similar similar experiences, uh, having to deal with the same issues. And I know you've been told over and over again, you're not alone. There's somebody out there that's gonna out there to help and it's no lie it's no joke you know i think that's that's a big factor in the distance between the guys on our deployment that were family that for some reason and i know the reason we just didn't talk over the years we didn't communicate because i think we went our separate ways and we didn't want to burden our burden our brothers with this stuff because you know they were probably going through similar things and they didn't Maybe they weren't the same point, the same, because there's, you know, everybody's at different points, you know. It's very, very seldom somebody's in the same, same mentality, the same spot as you, but, you know, I just, 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 uh, just don't lose. I think this is, uh, with what happened a couple weeks ago, with Rod, I think we need to really get really get back together you know this is important you know so got to keep got to keep uh keep in touch at least just let know let, let somebody know that they're they're out there they're not alone it may sound like a cliche you've heard it a thousand times but it's it's the fucking truth you know as we said you know uh me and star ice and star martinez we ain't seen each other you know in 12 years but you know you can still call I'm there for you. You can always call. I mean, it's there is no reason to take your own life. You need help, ask for help. You know, your buddies will be there for you. No matter how long, as I said, just like going back to being like, you know, the brother that you hate and, you know, everything. But, you know, I've got brothers, I've got brothers that I ain't talked to, you know, a year or two. But, you know, to me, if they called up today, they needed something. Hey, it's gonna happen. I'm gonna help out. You know, it's the same way. You know, other people that you bonded with, especially in a situation of, you know, say, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan, but you know, some war type or combat type situation, you're gonna build that bond and it's always gonna be there. It's not gonna go away. It's not like, you know, a nine month Kuwait deployment where it's like, oh yeah, hey, we stayed in the same cubicle where we stayed in the same hut for you know nine months now we're back it's like okay peace i'm out but you don't have i mean so you know that is not going to be as strong of a bond as you know going through something traumatic like iraq or afghanistan some combat situation so even if you don't think anybody is caring or out there for you you know hey go ahead and surprise yourself Call one of your buddies that you deployed with. See what they're going to do. Guarantee they'll be there for you. Last message? Anything? Last message. Look, uh, right, look right in the camera and let everybody know out there. Yep. Just say, no reason to take your life. Your life is worth more than, I mean, you know, you're worth more to the community that you're currently in now than what you would be if you were gone. And just always remember, you know, hey, 
you take your life is going to not affect you anymore, but it's going to affect everybody that was around you. So, you know, do the right thing. Ask for help. There's always people out there to help you. So when someone commits suicide, we ask ourselves about the signs. What did we see? What did I miss? Perhaps we wasn't looking. Perhaps we just wanted to comfort the situation with silence. Our way of giving someone space. How do you comfort an injured lion that you're afraid to get too close to? We have to let our veterans know that they have space. That they have a space to feel free, to feel like it's okay, to feel like they don't have to die at home because they survived the war that somebody else couldn't return from. Let's give them a full opportunity to readjust to a new situation. Before that, we have to understand it. So why is it when somebody is haunted by the effects of combat, we want to face them with the same normal expectations and, be, and belittle them and call them weak? Many of the men that I know on the edge are warriors who have always kept death close in mind. Tomorrow's battle is won during today's practice. So stay tuned to another Struggle Beyond the Decade. Just watched episode four, Struggle Beyond the Decade documentary series. I'm Bob Putnam, hope you enjoy episode five. This has been a Fat Ham production. That's the end of the show. Yeah, and, and the, but there, here's, 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 here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though.